Well, hey again, guys. So glad you're here. Uh, and those of you I hadn't gotten to see yet, hey, so glad. Um, for everyone on Zoom and those who will be watching later, as you know, we're going to be recording tonight. So uh, hopefully many will go back and watch this and kind of get to hear what we're going to be talking about tonight. So if you're here, hopefully you know why you're here. So tonight we're continuing our Behind the Mask series. Throughout this fall, this semester, we've been uh, talking about different topics, kind of more uh, vulnerable, kind of real topics, uh, kind of getting behind the mask, saying, hey, we want to walk in the light. We want to be honest. We want to tell the truth. Uh, and we want to be real about life. And uh, we want to know what God has to say about those things. And so we've talked about fear and anxiety. Last month, we talked about uh, dating and marriage. And tonight, we're talking about holiday complexities, okay? And so what we mean by that is that uh, as everybody's kind of getting ready to go home for the holidays, probably you've already been home last week and seeing your family, maybe for the first time in a while, and uh, you've got a little bit of school left, maybe a few days or weeks, and then you'll probably be home for a, a while. And for some of us, that may look like a few days. For some, it may look like a few weeks. And hopefully, that's like a fun, happy, exciting thing. But for most, if not all of us, uh, to some extent, there's some maybe anxiety around that or some fear or some uncertainty. Uh, there's just some complex things about family and holidays and uh, returning home and things like that. And so that's why we're here tonight. We want to kind of talk about those things because so God does speak to us about real things. Y'all know that, right? Like in the Bible, uh, God talks about real things. And uh, we do have instructions in the Bible about what family life is supposed to be like, right? We're told that our families are supposed to be a place of love and respect and honor and submission and putting others above yourself. And we may know these, these concepts, but they're easier said than done, right? <laughs> Agreed? Yeah. Like the golden rule, right? Doing to others as we would have done to ourselves. We've known that since we were like five and you struggle to do it when you're like 25 or 55, I guess, you still struggle with it. Uh, so these things are complex, okay? They're not easy. They're not uh, as simple as they sound sometimes. And um, that's what we wanna kind of unpack tonight is being honest about those things while also figuring out how do we navigate these complex things in healthy and godly ways, right? And in ways that uh, actually show the gospel and uh, how to live in love with those around us, uh, even those closest to us, like our families. Y'all with me? So that's what tonight's about. And I'm not just going to talk, so praise, praises for that. Uh, we have some professionals here tonight, and they're here because these are things that they're passionate about and very experienced in. So uh, I'm going to let y'all just give a brief introduction uh, about who you are and what you do and kind of why you're here, other than that I asked you. You want ladies to go first? Or? <laughs> yeah, ladies first. that's a great idea, Mr. Steve. Okay, hey y'all, I'm Whitney, and I am a licensed professional counselor, temporary, so that means I'm getting my full license right now. Um, I work at a practice in downtown Memphis called Cardia, but I'm working from my house right now, so working from my house, um, fun times, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. Thanks, that's perfect. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Roark. I am Barrett's father-in-law. Um, Michelle is my oldest daughter. I've been with you guys a number of times in the past. Uh, I'm a marriage and family therapist. Uh, retired as a CEO of a community mental health center a number of years ago because I felt God calling me back to my roots, which is family uh, therapy and marriage therapy. And so I started a nonprofit to do that out of. I've since moved to Oxford from Yazoo City. I still have clients and go back to First Baptist in Yazoo City, and I'm now working at First Baptist in Oxford and at other churches, as I'm called. But I am a marriage and family therapist. Most importantly, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and that plays into everything I do, which includes counseling. So I'm honored to be here, and hopefully uh, uh, we, I will say whatever the Lord wants me to say tonight. So thank you for the opportunity. That's perfect. And so could you all maybe even backtrack a little bit more and share a little bit about why you do what you do for a career? Like, what is it that you're passionate about? What is it that uh, kind of drew you into that, into counseling? Uh, 
I have a, a real passion for strong families and, and great marriages. Um, I suppose that the very transparent with you, I uh, grew up in a family where that didn't exist. Uh, my parents didn't have a great marriage, and uh, as God and his great divine plan uh, used that to give me a heart and a passion for strong marriages. Uh, so, so the thing that I uh, enjoy the most is being able to do whatever I can to strengthen families, and, and it all starts with good marriages. Uh, so that's, I'm, I'm, he, when Mitchell said 55, he looked at me, and he didn't realize that I'm 66. <laughs> I appreciate You've that. You've been there. <laughs> right. I've done that, yeah. <laughs> but even at 66, I'm still very um, passionate about marriages. That's why I continue to do what I do and want families to be all that God intended for them to be. So that's, that's where I, why I do what I do. Thanks. That's really helpful. Yeah, Whitney, what about you? I'm way nearer to the game, so I feel very inadequate, and um, I guess what got me interested in the first place is I feel like I have a passion for truth and for freedom. Like, those two things I get really excited about, and I really want to share with other people, and so that's what I love about counseling is getting to walk with people in places where there are lies and be like, all right, let's try and walk towards truth mm. and where there's oppression or bondage or being stuck and be like, okay, let's find freedom because in Christ we have both of those things and the enemy would like to take us out of that in our life. And so I'm really passionate about that. And also I'm very new in my career, so I'm still figuring out all of my passion. Yeah, for sure. No, that makes sense. That's great. That's really helpful, I think, for, for me even just to hear, you know, more of y'all's hearts uh, as I'm getting to hear from y'all as well. Uh, so w- when I mentioned this, this idea to both of you, you were both pretty excited. Y'all were both like, oh yeah, that's needed. That's important. That's relevant. Um, so could y'all share a little bit about why you felt that way? Like what is it, what is it that maybe you've seen in your experiences and your professions um, around this, con- this topic? Uh, holidays, family, uh, maybe even f- for young for young people uh, returning to their families, what are things that y'all have seen that you feel like are really relevant, either issues or struggles that you feel like are are common? I think that uh, what happens to a lot of us during the holidays is all of you know who Norman Rockwell is and the paintings that he did, and it looks like perfection. And there are no families that are perfect. And we need to, to make that clear. All, all of us have challenges and issues in families and holidays bring us to a point though where we think this is going to be that perfect time and we need to to recognize that we're in a fallen world and we have fallen families and we have challenges but we still love we still show the grace of God we still uh, be who we're supposed to be but the point the thing that excites me is to recognize for all of us to recognize that uh, the not to have our expectations that this is going to be that perfect Norman Rockwell holiday and everybody's going to be just singing around the Christmas tree and somebody playing the piano and it's just this euphoria. And some of that, every now and then those moments happen. But the truth is, is that that all of us come from broken families to to some degree and we need to recognize that and then just to, to seek God's guidance on what our role is in the family and to be the shining light in our family. So that's why it excites me, is not to be the negative downer here, but to recognize that we all need to make sure our expectations are accurate and then go forward with those expectations. Yeah. It kind of starts with just being honest. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. kind of being real about what what the holidays are actually going to be like with my family. Right. Yeah. Right. I, and then personally, I, I, a personal story is that when I was in college, uh, my mother suffered from some depression, and when I would come home for the holiday, uh, I, I would do all the Christmas decorations uh, and try to create the Christmas spirit. Um, and I recognized that that uh, I put myself in a very difficult place because I couldn't create that. But I needed to work through that and recognize what my real role was. So the, 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 the truth of me is, is that I had to come to a place of real expectations in my own family. And, and then to, to be who I'm supposed to be through that process. That's great. What about you, Winnie? What have you seen so far that makes this topic seem so relevant? I, I agree with exactly what you're saying. I feel like, I mean, I am 29, so I'm not super far, but I'm kind of far from, removed from, like, my first time, you know, being 
not in high school and like part of my family and being an adult and independent and then still being in my family when I go back. And there's a really confusing part that I feel like I personally have walked through of like, okay, how do I like be a part of this family? But now I'm also realizing things that like feel a little bit difficult and I don't know really what to do with them and I'm changing, but my family feels maybe the same or maybe my family's changing and I don't know what to do with that. Um, and so I get really excited about it because there is hope that our families can be even better when they grow and change. And that can be through us changing too. And it's really uncomfortable. And so I get really excited because that is freedom and truth of like, it's going to be hard when change happens. And change does happen when we get older and when we become independent. Um, and so I get really excited about talking about that because I think there's freedom in it. And, yeah. and it's also really hard too. Yeah. Okay, okay. No. I don't interrupt you. No, okay. no, no. So, yeah, do, do y'all kind of relate with that? Like you, okay, so obviously you grew up in your family. <laughs> okay, obviously. Uh, but then all of you, you've been, you've been gone, uh, you've been away from your family to different extents, right? Some of you live across the country from your family, and some of you may, maybe have lived across the city from your family, but you've, you've been away to some extent, and then you realize that you've changed, Maybe they've changed. Maybe it doesn't seem like they have. But all of a sudden, your relationship is different than it was, of course, when you were 12 or however old, right? And that can kind of be uncomfortable. That can sort of be awkward. That's sort of what you're speaking to there, Whitney. So I, I think something I'm, I'm wondering, and I think probably for most of us, is how should, uh, how should an, a, an adult relationship look like with their parents? Okay, so I'm an adult, I'm 18, 20, 22, 25, 30. What should my relationship look like with my parents? Like, what does it mean? So when the Bible says to honor your father and mother, right? You'll be blessed if you do that, when you honor your father and mother. So we know when we're 10, that means we do whatever they say. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that necessarily when we're in our 20s or older. So what... What, what should that look like? What does it mean to honor your father and mother when you, you've moved on? I guess I have several thoughts. Uh, one is that the whole process of parenting is uh, ultimately for the child to be an adult on an equal level with the parent and to be friends with the parent. Uh, and we have to recognize, each of us, are we there yet? Uh, we're not going to change someone else. We can only change ourselves. And so we have to evaluate for ourselves when we do have holidays or more family members but holidays sort of bring it to the epitome of that is to or how are we behaving are, are we putting ourselves in a position of being that child again or are we being the adult that we're supposed to be and that, that behavior means put, setting boundaries clear and decisive boundaries uh, and that sometimes creates some conflict but that ultimately is what we're supposed to do is to be uh, equal on equal flooring with our parents and and as a result then we have the kind of relationships that really will have more impact as we move forward to being the adults we're supposed to be uh, with that said I think that it's important to then recognize that we have to uh, decide for ourselves in our own self-talk how we're going to handle that I mean, the truth is everybody here and everybody on TV is has self-talk we, we're, we're we talk to ourselves more than we do anybody else you know, before tonight, I talked to myself about, okay, how's this going to go? And we, 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 as we talk to ourselves, we have to evaluate what are we saying to ourselves. So as, as the holidays approach, what are you saying to yourself in regard to the adult-child relationship? Are you saying, well, my, my dad will put me down, or my mom will say this, or my Aunt Susie will be the one that will always criticize me? And we have to decide for us, as we talk to ourselves, where, what are we going to do with that, and how are we going to put ourselves in that, one, in that adult position, and then set those boundaries so that we protect ourselves, but at the same time that we're the person we're supposed to be with them, to, to be the Jesus to them in that situation. I recall when I was growing up, my grandmother, and she, God bless her so, uh, she was very critical. And uh, I'm sure my wife is watching this tonight, but I remember we went there for a, a holiday, and uh, my grandmother said, Ginger, you're getting big as a cow. <laughs> And I think we all laugh at that. Well, we all got family members. 
<laughs> I see hands going up. <laughs> and we all have family members like that. And what we have to do is, as an adult, again, is to take responsibility. I couldn't change my big mom. I couldn't. It was impossible. But what we could do is change ourselves. And what we had to do is to become the adult and then put up boundaries and then decide that we're not going to put ourselves in those positions where we get our feelings hurt by having the conversations that are that are we can control and then when we can't then we have to walk away from those conversations not in a negative way or not in a hurtful way but to be able to protect ourselves does that make any sense yeah that makes a lot of sense so you talked a lot about boundaries there i think that's a very relevant topic for probably everybody right boundaries are always necessary at every stage of life so when do you want to speak to that some about what that looks like how do we know when to set boundaries how do we do that any, any sure. thoughts there? Yeah. Want to make sure it's on? Yeah. You're um, so, yeah, it's kind of hard of, like, I, I feel like a big question that I think a lot and I feel like a lot of my friends ask a lot and even clients is, like, okay, well, I'm supposed to love other people. I'm supposed to have grace. I'm supposed to turn the other cheek. And so if this upsets me, why, like, when do I say something? Like, when is it not okay anymore? And when is it something where I'm, like, it's not loving for me to ask them to stop doing that because they maybe want to, like maybe they think it's fun to joke around like that or to, you know, maybe maybe it's not even like a mean thing, but it could be a boundary of like, my family never stops moving and I get exhausted <laughs> and I don't want to go to another event because I'm just worn out. And as a kid, you've got to go. Like you better, you know, suck it up and get in the car. And as we get older, we still feel that tension, kind of like you're talking about with like, you feel like you're still a child because you're with your family. So it just feels very like natural to be like, well, I'm around these people and this is what happens when we're all together. This is what we do. And we kind of act differently than we do maybe when we're on our own as adults. And we don't like the way that feels, but you can't, it feels like you can't get out of it. Like you feel like this is what always happens. And, um, so that's our family system that we all have, and it's just the way it works. It's just the way that it's always been, and it's the way it goes. And we all have different dysfunctions in our families, and, you know, if Lord willing, we all go to have our own families, they'll have dysfunction too like that. So it's not that our families are horrible. It's just that they're broken. And so that's part of all of our families. So when we start feeling that brokenness, maybe part of it is like, I am way more introverted and lower energy than the rest of my family. And I don't want to go do this right now. My, like, you know, someone in my family, if that's true in my family, some of my family might get really upset with me and be like, Whitney, do you not love us? Do you not want to hang out with us? You're hurting my feelings. And that might be true. They might feel like I don't care about them. But the truth is, like, I'm going to be in a pretty grumpy mood <laughs> if I go. <laughs> I'm be, and I might say something I don't mean, and I might actually be unkind. Um, and so a boundary in that is being able to say, okay, what's actually loving and what's actually like owning my choices as an adult and not just doing what people tell me to, but getting to make my own choices in this of like, actually, this is probably what's best for me right now. And it might make other people a little uncomfortable. They might make assumptions about why I did this. And also I know the truth and I'm going to try and communicate the truth. So maybe saying like, hey, I really want to spend time with y'all. And also I'm exhausted. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. And I'm going to go home. So that is a less volatile boundary that's not as emotional. But of course, we need to set boundaries, too, when it comes to emotional things that are a lot harder. But that's an easy one to think about where it's like, okay, well, I'm an adult, so I don't have to go. Um, but that's one is where we're noticing, I feel guilt. I feel like I should be doing something. But I, we don't need to feel guilt. We don't need to let guilt drive us. Um, so I'd say one is guilt. Another one, when it comes to more emotional, more complex issues, is when you start to feel bitter. And this is true in any relationships, not just with our families. But if we start to feel bitterness, that's where we're sinning. And that's where our role in that is to walk in repentance. And that is going to be setting a boundary and addressing, like, okay, I'm starting to feel angry. I'm starting to feel bitter that this happens over and over again. And so I need to set a boundary here. And that can look a lot of different ways. But those are the two things that I thought of. So That is so powerful. And I, the only thing I would add to that is, is deciding to give yourself permission 
I think it, that's, those are powerful words, is to give yourself permission that if your, your family expects you to be there for a week and you really don't want to be there for a week, then give yourself permission that three days is what I'm going to be there. Or in your case, Whitney, that your family wants you to do all these things and you're, you don't want to, giving yourself permission to say what you just said. And I think we, we need to decide to give ourselves that lead way, to get, and that's what adults do. Adults, children don't. Adults give themselves permission. Okay, I'm an adult. This is what's best for me so that I don't become bitter, so that I don't become angry, so that I can be all that I'm supposed to be to, to them and to, to myself. I mean, self-care is huge. And, again, giving yourself permission for self-care, especially in the holidays. Because what, what happens to a lot of us is because of the demands and, and the dynamics of our families, we, we often neglect ourselves. We neglect our quiet time. And, again, what we have to do is be disciplined about it and give ourselves permission to be able to say, this is what I'm going to do. Like when, if when, we were, when my wife and I were uh, early marriage, we would decide this is the length of time that we would go to Tupelo. And we would know when we would get there and when we'd come back. So giving yourself permission, I challenge you to just decide in your thought life to give yourself permission. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. These are the boundaries I'm going to have during the holidays. And I'm going to stick to them because I'm an adult. And it doesn't mean I don't love them. It doesn't mean that I don't care for them. It means I'm taking care of myself so that I can be what I'm supposed to be to them. That's great. That's really helpful. What, what do you got? With can I add one thing? thing? I think this is really helpful to know. Always, when you set a boundary, there will always be resistance and backlash for, in some way because you're disrupting the norm. It doesn't mean it's wrong. So that's not a good way to decide if it's right or wrong is if you have pushback. It may just be a good change that's uncomfortable for people. So there, But there will always be resistance to boundaries and change. So just expect that. I was talking to this couple about, about that very topic not long ago, and uh, this family, the, 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 the girl, the lady's family, uh, expected the family to come, husband, wife, and two children to come for six days. And it was really too long for them. And they decided to only do three days. Well, pushback. The, the family that had always expected got really upset and got angry and had outbursts, and it was kind of ugly. But the truth is it was the right thing to do. So you're right. When, when you disrupt how a system has always operated, and because of your boundaries, then don't allow that to determine going forward because boundaries are healthy. I think boundaries are biblical, personally. Uh, so I think you're, you're spot on, Whitney. Do you want to say anything more about that, about boundaries, like kind of just the role of that in our lives or what that looks like? You, Whitney, you gave some examples. Do, do we want to go any deeper there, maybe with other examples of what that might look like or... Uh, even you, you just mentioned even kind of a biblical basis for boundaries. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that boundaries are, are interesting. There's a great book, by the way, by John Townsend and um, Henry, Henry, Henry McLeod and John Townsend. And it's a great book. I'd highly recommend it to anybody. But the essence of boundaries is that we put up fences. Fences make great neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> they do. And they make great relationships. And what that means to me, one of the things it means is to make sure that I'm responsible for me and you're responsible for you. I sat with a, a couple just yesterday, and they've been married for 38 years, and she has a lot of sickness, and that sickness has identified their relationship, and that's the, this, the become the, the, the core, the identity of their relationship. So we had to walk back from that and help them to realize that her health was her responsibility because her husband was a bit of a perfectionist and a fixer, and he's been trying to fix her for years. And you can imagine how the relations, because she's not really getting any healthier. And so the boundary was, okay, she's responsible for her own health. She's responsible whether or not she eats that next cinnamon roll, not you. And you're responsible for being be taking care of you. So boundaries are, is, I think that we all need to be cognizant and aware of how huge boundaries are in our marriages, in our relationships with our friends, in our relationships with our families, and especially during the holidays. That's great. Yeah, so I'm responsible for me, you're responsible for you. Exactly. That's the essence that's, of boundaries. That's, 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 okay. Yeah. That's great. That's a good, good rule of thumb, I think, I can't make you better. Only yeah. you can make you better. Yeah. No, I love that. And Whitney, you, you kind of spoke to some of the ways I know that, I'm, that I don't have healthy boundaries. You, you mentioned guilt and bitterness, right? And kind of the, the alternative to that is setting boundaries that keep me healthy and then help me to love others, Right? So, so I guess something I'm kind of wondering is that there's some tension there because that, that sounds very clear, but what do we do when I feel 
I feel some pressure. I feel like there's something I don't really want to do. Or my mom is driving me crazy, okay? When do I um, humble myself and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I'm going to let her be her? And when do I confront? When do I say something? When do I say that's not okay? Does that make sense? Like, how do I know? Because I think all of us sort of tend towards one or the other, right? Some of us tend towards, I'm going to sort of avoid this and just survive. And then some of us tend towards, I'm, I'm going to fight back, right, when I feel like my boundaries aren't being respected. How do we know? Does that make sense? Maybe that's your point to Whitney. That's for her, yeah. How do, how do I know? And could we give some examples? Because I think that's probably what we're all thinking. And hopefully you are. That's my encouragement to you is as we're talking here, don't just let these be ideas, but really be thinking about what does this mean for me in the coming weeks, you know, or just in my ongoing relationships with family members and even others in my life, friends um, and other relationships. How do, how do I know wh- what to do? Does that make sense? It does. Okay. I don't know that I can answer your question. (laughs) I know that's a really big question. (laughs) It is. And I think it's very situationally specific. So it's kind of hard to answer it in a blanket statement. Um, What I would say probably is look at your heart, first of all, um, of like, how am I doing right now? Am I feeling prideful, resentful? Am I feeling humble? Am I feeling loving? Am I feeling close to the Lord in this? Like, am I asking the Lord about this? Um, is where I would start. That's great, yeah. But I think it's it's a definitely a pretty hard question. Yeah. I struggle with it myself, too, of just knowing, like, and I really think that's a place of humility with the Lord, too, of, okay, I can't tell this boundary right now. Lord, will you help me? And I believe he will, like that he will lead us towards love. And love is not being nice. Like being nice is giving people what they want and making them feel good. Being kind and loving is actually wanting good for them. And things that are painful are good for us often. Not always. Sometimes pain is destructive, but when pain is life-giving, it's not bad. And so... I forgot where I was going with that. No, that's great. Really, really good. The only thing I'd add to that is if, if we go in, going into the holidays or any time in relationships with making sure we have clear boundaries, making sure we're having self-care, making sure that we're having the proper self-talk and we're seeking the Holy Spirit, then if we're getting angry and resentful, then we have to, again, examine our heart. Again, we, that whoever that person is in your family or three or four, and they have the politics that you don't want to talk about, and they, they want to bring it up. Well, you have a choice. Do you participate in that or not? If you participate, then you have decided to participate, and therefore you're putting yourself in that position. And you have the power to be able to say, I really don't want to have this discussion. And if we do all those things, then the changes, the dynamics of the relationship as it was before. So back to your question, if we do those things, then the people... I know in my life, the people that, in my extended family that have done that, then if I'm not doing what I just said I need to do, then I'm going to get very angry and resentful and, and act stupid or say something I shouldn't say or, or leave the room or whatever. But if we take care of those things, then those relationships often change as a result of it because we're not allowing that situation to control us. Yeah, that's great. And I like what you brought up about, uh, you know, conversations like, I choose, I, I, I get to willingly choose to be a part of a conversation or not, right? Like I know, I think probably for all of us when we go home, there, there are probably already, I could ask you to raise your hands, and there are certain questions you don't want to answer or you're just tired of hearing, right? Like, well, what are you doing after you finish school? Or uh, are you dating anybody? Or, you know, these certain questions that you're like, I don't want to hear it, like I'm, I'm, that's heavy enough for me. I'm, I'm working through it. I don't need my aunt, who doesn't actually talk to me very much, to ask me about that, right? Like, she's not very invested in my life. She just doesn't know what else to talk about. So how do I, how do I set a boundary in a conversation like that? So, Mr. Steve, you, you, you mentioned, basically, I get to choose. I get to choose whether I enter that conversation. How, how would I go about doing that? Obviously, I can't ignore my crazy aunt, but what, what can I do? 
Actually, you can ignore well, your answer. I guess you could. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could. Well, you know, it, it takes some good conversational skills, but but you don't have to answer that question. You can divert the, the, to another question. You can you can get her to talk about. What I found is if you can get somebody to talk about themselves, you don't have to worry so much about what you have to say. So you can get Aunt Susie to talk about her latest gout problem or, or whatever and, and, and have that discussion with her so that you aren't put in that position. And then she quickly or soon can walk away from that. Now, that does not mean you don't love her. We're not talking about loving, and, and Whitney mentioned that. But it means that you're protecting yourself from that perhaps toxic relationship. So you just you don't have to. You, you know, if, if she says, you know, you've been married for six years, and why aren't you having any babies? That happens all the time. And, and you, you don't have to answer those questions. You can divert those questions. Or you can't even have discussions with family members before you get there. That's, that's not unwise, actually, to, to call people, call your mom and dad or your, your whoever, and say, you know, I want to make sure, and this is one I really would highly suggest, let's not talk about politics at the dinner table. You know, because, boy, I can tell you how many, you all know, I see your faces through the mask. Everybody's got family that are one way or the other and are challenged by it all. And it, it really is wise to have those discussions beforehand and say, you know, I, I really want us not to talk about that. And I'm choosing not to talk about it. And I just want you all to be aware of that. And, and that takes boldness, but it also is an adult. And if, if you can't have that conversation beforehand, and if you feel bold enough before, around the dinner table when everybody gets there, hey, everybody, I'm so glad to see everybody. It's great. I just wanted y'all to know we're not going to talk about politics. <laughs> and Aunt Susie's going to say, well, no, we're not going to talk about politics. I love you, Susie, Aunt Susie, but we're not going to talk about politics. And that's setting a good boundary because I think there are going to be lots of challenging discussions around dinner tables, as it were last week, around politics and the challenges that we have that really are not going to produce anything. Uh, and so, therefore, we can do something about it by deciding beforehand we're not going to have that dis those discussions. That's great. I love that. Helpful. Good. So, I, I, I want to, we've got about 10 minutes or so left, guys. I want to be uh, sensitive to your time, and, and then we'll, uh, you're, you're free to hang around, and we'll have some kind of Q&A time. If there are things that you're thinking, you know, write down questions, put them in your phone or anything, if there are certain uh, specific questions you have. I, I do want to kind of, um, hit on something that I think is probably important for many um, is uh, what do I do when I'm sad about something over the holidays? Like I feel like a lot of people feel pressure to uh, be happy because it's Christmas time or be happy because I'm with my family. Um, what do I do when I'm sad or I'm angry about something that's going on in my life or someone that I just lost or uh, just something I'm, I'm grieving, right? Like, what do I do with that um, and still enjoy the holidays? <laughs> Does that make sense? What yeah. do y'all think about that? So sadness, I kind of think of Cindy Lou Who in The Grinch with, um, who is it? Uh, the, or Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey, yeah. yes. Where she sings that song when she's little and she's like so sad and she's like, where are you Christmas? Why can't I find you? I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, I remember feeling that of like, <laughs> oh, like I'm like sadness for the first time at Christmas where I felt disappointment, I guess, that it wasn't as magical as it had been the year before. And that I felt like so afraid that like something was so wrong and afraid that I needed to like fix it and make it better. Um, and I... I feel like, you know, that is so common with things that are supposed to be celebratory, like special days, um, special seasons in life, really just a day that you built up in your head and we're really looking forward to, and then you get to it and it's broken and it's painful, and then it feels like you can't even be sad because you're not supposed to be sad, and then you numb if you're not letting yourself feel, and then you're not even there, <laughs> like you're just not, you're not with people, um, and so we definitely don't like feeling sad, of course, and um, would rather not. But if you think about it, like Jesus felt all the emotions, and God gave us emotions, and some of them are more uncomfortable than others. And when we run away from them, that's when they get a lot of power over us. And so actually, it's okay if we're sad, and if we can just be with that sadness, it won't be here for forever. 
And it will, though, haunt us if we don't let it exist in our awareness. And so it's actually a good thing to let ourselves feel sad. It's actually really freeing, and it keeps us from becoming depressed and anxious because those are ways we respond to sadness or fear or hurt that we don't want to see and can't, can't handle it. So it's actually a beautiful thing to allow ourselves to be honest about being sad. Um, and so with emotions... Our joy is as deep as our sorrow gets. So if, I'm, if I love somebody and then I lose them, the level that I have joy over the love for them is the level of grief I'm going to feel. And so it's mirror image. And that's with everything in life. Of The level of love and joy I have for my family is the level of pain I'll feel when I don't feel close to them and feel that hurt. And so it's not bad. It means that we actually love. And if we numb, we're not able to feel happy either. So I think acceptance of both and that God's with us in both and he can handle our sadness and he gave us our sadness. And that a lot of times out of that comes redemption and healing. And Barrett talked about it on Sunday of like in hard and painful things, the Lord brings life. And that when we run from it, that's when we're not even present in our lives. But so pressing into that, I would say, is like that to be okay with not being okay brings a lot of freedom in that sadness. So it's okay to be sad. It is and it's good. okay yes. if, if your family notices that and says you're kind of different, you're kind of down, that's okay. Yes. I can be honest about but that. But your family might not be okay with that. So that's kind of a tough part. Actually, this Thanksgiving... I am grieving something, and someone who loves me was asking how to support me, and I said, I think I just would rather cry than pretend like I'm okay. I think that would hurt less to cry than to pretend like I'm fine, and it really was true, and so that was a freeing moment for me to be able to say what I needed and then to not feel like I had to pretend like I was fine, but to be present, but I have one more thing that I was thinking. So our families are broken and when we feel that, that's us longing for our eternal family and for heaven. And so there's hope even in the disappointment that we're going to feel with our families that there is a greater family that we are already a part of and that the Lord perfectly is with us in all those places that everyone around us hurts us so that we hurt other people, that the Lord is good and that our families are good, but they're not ultimate, like that we have a more real family, which is the family of God. So there's a lot of hope in that. I just finished a book by David Jeremiah on heaven. Highly recommend it, and it, it speaks just to that. So it's a it, very eloquent thing. It's great, yeah, really good perspective. Oftentimes it's what we need. You mentioned the sermon from this past Sunday. I think that was, it, it was it was about perspective, really, right? And and seeing the, the bigger picture. I think often that's what we need in when we're kind of in the weeds of life, whether that's family or uh, just things that we're dealing with, like we got to be honest about where we're at, but it's also good to zoom out and kind of remember the bigger picture, right? We need perspective. And I think that's probably helpful for all of us around the holidays, like pray for perspective and, and work at having a, a like a, a godly perspective on these situations we're in. Right, like seeing beyond just the, the 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 moment, and so I the last question I was going to ask is sort of you mentioned this earlier, Mr. Steve, about kind of keeping yourself healthy, self care, and so kind of that, that's I think the last thing I wanted to ask uh, is just any kind of just uh, practical advice for how to care for yourself, stay healthy, keep perspective um, on on things throughout the holidays. Uh, yes, I think that uh, exercise is huge. I mean, and some of us are more prone to exercise than others, but some kind of movement. Uh, holidays have this way of changing our routines, and uh, so we have to be very disciplined about maintaining those routines. Routines are really important for our mental health. Uh, and so if you're a person who walks, in my case, I, I try to walk every day, every morning. Holidays, usually I, it's hard to do that. So exercise is one thing. Uh, maintain your quiet time. Uh, that's another thing that it's easy to go. You know, you 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 got to go shopping or, or you're going to be at your family's house. But having a time where you sit and and just contemplate 
God's presence and pray for wisdom and knowledge and truth. Uh, and, and giving yourself, all of us are either introverts or extroverts. We, ex, we introverts like a more quiet time and time to ourselves. Extroverts like more activity. The way to really measure that is what gives you energy. If you get a lot of energy when you're around a lot of people, typically you're an extrovert. If you are wasted after you've been around a lot of people uh, and you don't have energy, then you're an introvert. Doesn't mean either one is better than the other. But either one, though, you need time to yourself. We introverts need more time to ourselves and again, giving ourselves permission to be able to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, if you're at your parents' house, I'm going to be with you guys at 10 in the morning. But until then, I'm going to be in my room or, or run, taking a run or going out to Walmart or whatever. And then from 10 to 2, I will be with y'all. But in the morning, I'll have my quiet time. So being disciplined about those things that, that, that float your boat uh, and making sure that, that you are very focused on that so that, again, you're able to. When we don't take care of ourselves, it's hard to take care of others. Yes. It's just, it's impossible. And what happens to us in the holidays is that we get so worn out that we aren't able to take care of others the way God wants us to. So tell yourself to be disciplined and take care of yourself. That's really good. It's kind of ironic, right, that, like, it's loving to others when I take care of myself, right? It's loving to those around me. Whitney, any final thoughts on that or I would say all the exact same things. The only thing I would add would be plan ahead. So that will be really hard to do in the moment. So maybe plan ahead and say, okay, this is when I'm going to do this, and this is how I'm going to protect that time. Maybe I need to tell somebody so they don't plan something for me to do during that time. Or maybe I need to, you know, bring this with me so I'm sure that I can go on a walk, bring my tennis shoes. Just planning ahead before you're in the middle of stress is definitely a great way to set yourself up for success. In that. That's great. Maybe something for all of us to, to try, like, you know, as you, you finish school, before you head home, maybe take a, a, a moment to make a list of, like, here are, the, here are my healthy rhythms, my, my uh, routines I'm going to try to keep through, you know, through the, this next week or few weeks or whatever. Uh, I think that's a really really good idea. We could all benefit from that. Well, guys, I, it's 730, so I want to kind of wrap up so that if anybody needs to leave, they, they can. Can we go ahead and thank our panel real quick?